Okay, we're carrying on. Uh, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 5. This, you know, you see these quick backups, they get shorter and shorter. But I always want to keep you knowing at least how I'm understanding things. That way you can evaluate whether you think I'm tracking correctly what John is actually saying. But in chapter 1, verse 5, John says that the message the apostles, the apostles heard from Jesus and what they threw John proclaim to his readers is that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all and because God is light and in him there's no darkness at all John says in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1 he says that walking in the light living in submission to the will of God living a life that's characterized by obedience that that's essential for fellowship with God referring to the false teachers he says that those who claim to have fellowship with God while walking in darkness, while living as rebels, while living lives characterized by disobedience, they're lying. They have no fellowship with God. On the other hand, those who have a true faith, a faith that includes surrender and is not simply intellectual assent, they have fellowship with one another in an ongoing cleansing of their sins through Christ's sacrifice. He says in verses 8 through 10 of chapter 1 that if we deny we're guilty of sin, as the false teachers were doing, we're deceiving ourselves and the truth, God's word, is not in us. But if we confess our sins, if we cast them before God in repentance, he forgives and he cleanses us. Then in chapter 2, the first part of verse 1, he says he's writing these things so that they may not sin. He doesn't want them to twist the message of God's amazing grace into being casual about sin. And that was always a danger that you had. I mentioned that Paul had addressed that. You see that when you speak the truth about the depth and, and majesty of God's mercy, some can take it and say, okay, then I can be casual about sin and sin's not really a big deal. And so he doesn't want them to fall into that. And then in the second part of verse 1 of chapter 2, he assures them that when they do sin, which they will, if they will confess that sin, as he said in chapter 1 verse 9, rather than denying it, rather than insisting on continuing to live in it, they can rest assured that they are forgiven. And they can do so, they can rest assured that they are forgiven because their advocate with the Father is Jesus Christ the righteous. And he represents the Christian in the blood of his sacrifice, and no one he represents is condemned. Now, that's where we ended, ended last week. I want to say just a word about, uh, about verse 2, where he says here, he says in verse 2, and he's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. See, his death not only atoned, for the sins of Christians, but potentially for the sins of all people. You see that same idea in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 29, and in 1 John, chapter 4, verse 14, about the, the potential uh, uh, cleansing uh, of his death for all people. It exists there. He died for all people. The efficacy of his death will never be exhausted. And this is where some Calvinists... See, those who are traditional tulip people, where they say, no, he doesn't die for all people, he only dies for the elect. That's one of the places where I would disagree with them. And so here it, you see that this, uh, this idea, he atoned for the sins, not just for Christians, but potentially for the sins of all people, as Colin Cruz puts it. He says, we might suggest that Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, because his death was sufficient to deal with the sins of the whole world, but that his sacrifice does not become effective until people believe in him. You see, so I think in potential there it is. Its efficacy will never be exhausted, but to receive that, one must convert. One must become a Christian and place one's faith in him. Chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, he's going to repeat the ethical point he's been stressing, but he's going to do this now as a condition of assurance. So let's look, chapter 2, verse three, 3 through 6. He says, and by this we know that we have come to know him. By this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. 
The one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar. And in this one, the truth is not. But whoever keeps his word, truly in this one, the love of God has reached perfection. By this we may know we are in him. The one who claims to abide in him ought himself to walk just as that one walked. Verse 3, and by this we know that we've come to know him, if we keep his commandments. When John says that he and his readers can know that they have come to know him, he's using know in two different senses. They can know in the sense of knowing it's the case that they know him in the sense of being in fellowship with him. So they can know that they know him. In other words, they can be confident. They have a relationship with or are in fellowship with him. And by him, John probably means God the Father. Though Jesus is the nearest person to the pronoun, both the Father and the Son are mentioned in verse 2, and more importantly, the, the false teachers, those that John has in his mind, just like the full-blown Gnostics that succeeded them in the second century, they boasted about their relationship with God the Father. You can see in chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, that their claim was to have fellowship with God. And in chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, it's clear that they claimed that relationship, that fellowship with God, in distinction from a relationship with Jesus. So I think here when he says, when he's talking about here, that this idea that by this, by this we know that we've come to know him, he's speaking of a relationship with God. And the way that we, and he's focusing on them, he says the way, the way that we can be confident we have a relationship with God is what? And by this we may know we, we have come to know him. Well, by what? He says, if we keep his commandments. That's how we may know that we have come to know him. John's trying to reassure the faithful. He's trying to reassure the faithful who've been made insecure about their relationship with God by the false teachers. You see, they have made, they have upset the faithful. They have got the faithful thinking, well, am I right? They're over here telling me these things, that this is really the way to go. This is how you have to be. So they've generated this insecurity, and John is trying to reassure them that, that they, are, have a, they do have a relationship with God. And he's also trying to expose the false teachers as people who are deceived about their relationship with God. So he says the way we can be confident we have a relationship with God is if we keep his commandments. Now, keeping God's commandments is, of course, not the way to gain a relationship with the Father, nor is it the way that you sustain it. Our relationship with God is never based on our performance and our achievement. See, rather, it's characteristic of those who have a relationship with God. That's an important distinction. See, it's never something that is gaining and earning so that you put your works before God and say, this is the basis of my relationship with you, whether it's, it's getting into Christ or staying in. It's never based on your performance, but it's characteristic of those who have a relationship with God. In other words, a relationship with God necessarily has moral consequences. A relationship with God affects the way that we live. John is well aware that nobody keeps the commandments flawlessly. He just went on and made that clear in verses 8 through 10. He's perfectly aware that no one keeps the commandments flawlessly. But failing to keep the, to keep the commandments flawlessly, that's a far cry from failing to take them seriously. As the false teachers apparently were doing. You see, failing to live up to them flawlessly is different from failing to take them seriously. As John Stott says in his commentary, he says, If it is objected that in this case no one knows God, because no one is perfectly obedient, we may reply with Calvin. He does not mean that those who wholly satisfy the law keep his commandments, and no such insurance can be found in the world. But those who strive according to the capacity of human infirmity to form their life in obedience to God. 
That's what he's talking about. That's what he's after. Here's what I. Howard Marshall says. The question is whether I am trying and to some extent succeeding to keep God's commandments. This is the concept of where I am surrendered. I've given my life to God. It's not simply words and junk. That when I profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, when I say that Jesus is Lord, I mean it. Now, when that's the case, there will inevitably be manifestations of that in a person's life. You cannot go from saying, I don't think anything about God, I don't care about Jesus, to saying, wow, I believe he's Lord, and that that won't transfer into your life. Because if it doesn't transfer into your life, then when you say he's Lord, it's just words. It's, it doesn't mean anything. You are like the false teachers who think that how you live doesn't matter. But it does matter, not because it's the basis of your relationship, but because it's an inherent part of biblical saving faith. It inevitably works itself out that way. Colin Cruz, he says, those who know God will not be characterized by disobedience to his commandments. Will you sin? Yes. Does John know that? Yes. Has John not said that? Yes. But will you live in sin? Will your life be characterized by rebellion and disobedience? No. Because if, it's, if it is, then you are not a disciple. You are not someone who has cast your life on Christ in faith. That's what he's talking about. Now, we tend to think that, that since obedience is inadequate to save anyone because it's imperfect, it cannot provide any assurance of one's relationship with God, but that's exactly what John says it provides. You see, that's how we look. We say, no, it can't be the basis of any assurance because it's flawed. It's imperfect. But John says, who's well aware that it's flawed and imperfect, that it does, in fact, provide assurance. And I'm afraid that in our noble desire to honor God's grace, we sometimes have robbed brothers and sisters, of a God-given means of assurance. You see, it is not legalistic or prideful for a person to recognize when he keeps God's commandments in the imperfect sense that John means. That's not legalistic or prideful to understand that you keep God's commandments, that you are submitted to Christ, that you actually live like a Christian, even though you know you sin. But that's not legalistic or prideful to recognize that. Indeed, in chapter 2, verse 8, John tells his readers that the new command to love one another in a Christian sense was a reality in their lives as it was in Christ's. He can say to them, that, was, that is a reality in your life. He doesn't have to back up, oh, of course I know that you don't do it perfectly. Oh, he doesn't have to do that. You see, he tells them that. One can know whether one's faith in Christ has made a difference in how one lives. Can't you know that? Don't you know that your life has been different from the time you surrendered to Jesus? That he has gone from being somebody you didn't think about, care about, to now being the Lord of your life, and your life is conducted in obedience to him? Yes. You can know that. Well, yes, but I mess up. I know you mess up. John knows you mess up. Everybody knows you mess up. But that's different from not caring. That's different from not bowing. That's different from not being genuine. You see, and that's something that, that I think people really need to understand. You can know whether Christ has made a difference in your life whether the Spirit is producing fruit in your life. You can know that. And there's no shame in acknowledging that. There's no arrogance or pride in saying that God has transformed your life. You see, I think that's, that's something that uh, we need to hear. Of course, John's writing to those who've made an orthodox profession of faith, those who believe in the true incarnation of Christ, and all of the other things that are part of that original gospel. He's not suggesting that obedience divorced from such an orthodox confession provides any assurance of a relationship with God. 
He's writing in a specific context. He doesn't have to stop every time in footnotes as though he's writing a systematic theology and say, by the way, let me go into all this. He's not doing that. He's writing a real letter to real people. And there's an ongoing relationship there. In verse 4, the one who says, I've come to know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and in this one the truth is not. John's here is saying, is saying essentially the same thing he said in chapter 1, verse 6. As John Stott explains, he says, The positive principle of the previous verse, chapter 2, verse 3, is illustrated by a negative example. A person's words must be tested by his works. If he disobeys God's commandments, his claim to have come to know God is a lie. That's what he said in chapter 1, verse 6. However that strikes you, that's what John says. Okay, in chapter 1, he says his conduct contradicts his profession and proves it to be false. This is what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, where he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? He's saying there, listen, I don't care that your vocal cords are able to make the sounds that come out, Jesus is Lord. That's not the test. The test is, is that when the spirit within you is making those sounds, it is a true confession that there's substance behind it. If you just call me Lord, Lord, and you don't live the way I am, then you don't mean it. If you mean it, you will live the way I call you to live. And so that's what's being said here. Now, the thoughts, the thoughts and, and the judgments of the person who claims a relationship with God Without obedience, those thoughts and judgments are not controlled by the truth, which is what he says. Verse 5, whoever keeps his word truly in this one, the love of God has reached perfection. Now, with many commentators, I take of God, that little clause there, I take of God to be what's called an objective genitive, as in chapter 2, verse 15, and chapter 5, verse 3, rather than a subjective genitive. Genitive. You see, that thing of God, it's ambiguous, right? I mean, you see the same ambiguity in a phrase like appreciation of the workers. Well, does that mean you're appreciating the workers? Or is it the appreciation that the workers have? Are the workers the subject, the ones who have the appreciation? Or are the workers the object, the one receiving the appreciation? And so in this case, see, I think it's objective that he's talking about love for God instead of God's love for us. And like I say, many commentators share that. In the NIV, 1984, it translated and opted for a subjective genitive, just had it as God's love. But it footnoted the possibility of the objective genitive. Interestingly, the TNIV, I think 2007, 2008, and NIV 2011, that's reversed. They put then in the text, objective genitive, love for God, and footnote the subjective genitive, God's love. The Revised Standard Version uh, opts for our love for God, the objective in, in, in the text. Now, the person who keeps God's word is the one who has a mature or complete love for God. You see, when he says here, there's, his love has reached, uh, whoever keeps his word truly in this one, the love for God has reached perfection. You always have this question, this word perfection, how do we understand it? I think many times we're too quick to say that it means something like uh, completion or maturity. But here I think that's correct. As the NIV says, love for God is truly made complete in them. You see, a, a person here who keeps God's word, and this one has a truly mature or complete love for God, unlike the false teachers who do not obey God. The person who obeys his commandments has a mature or a complete love for God. Otherwise, their love is a deformed thing. It is not mature or complete. It's something incomplete. It is something that is short of true biblical love. Biblical love for God carries with it this sense 
of a surrender and an obedience. That's why Jesus could say in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We shake our head and go, what was that about? How, my love is just kind of this, this sense of feeling I have. No, these things are inextricably bound. You see, they're bound together. He says in 1 John 5, 3, For this is love for God that we keep His commandments. You see, so the, the person who keeps His word, that person has a mature love for God, a love that is not twisted and aborted and deformed. That person has a proper, mature love for God. I think that's what, that's what he's after here. The love of which God speaks, it's more than a sentiment. It's more than just a feeling. It's more than just emotions. It is, as I said, inextricably bound up with our conduct. You cannot speak of loving God apart from your relationship with Him and treating Him properly that way. That is part of loving God. He says, by this we may know we are in Him. Verse 6, the one who claims to abide in Him ought himself to walk just as that one walked. The way we can know we are in him, meaning the way we can be assured that we have an intimate communion with God, is by the axiom that the one who claims such a relationship must walk as Jesus did. That one, being a reference to Jesus elsewhere in the letter, in chapter 3, verse 3, 5, 7, 16, chapter 4, verse 17. So when he says, he who claims to abide in him ought himself to walk just as that one walked, ought himself to walk as Jesus walked. So if we live as Jesus lived, do you mean perfectly like the sinless Son of God? No. I don't mean that. John doesn't mean that. How do you think John can mean that? John has already talked about it and said, if you claim to be sinless, you're a liar. Okay, so we're not talking about that. But isn't there a direction and a submission of Jesus' life? Doesn't he live his life though he does perfectly, though you don't do perfectly? Can't you see that as I live as a Christian, that I walk in the same path as the Lord Jesus Christ? Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? To be a disciple? To be somebody who walks in the path of the master? Yes. And so that's what he's talking about. By this we may know we're in him. The one who claims to abide in him walk, uh, ought himself to walk just as that one walked. If we live as Jesus lived, we can know that we have a relationship with God. And if we don't live that way, then our claim to have a relationship with God is a lie. It's a lie. Yeah, no, I really, you know, Lord, we got our thing. Lord and I, uh, uh, I live any way I want, sleep with whoever I want, drink whatever I want, talk however I want, treat people however I want. But no, Lord and I are like that. Why? Because I love him. Well, then you don't understand. And it's frustrating. This is the kind of God and Christ and relationship that is just spewed out in our culture. It's almost it's mystical. You see, I know it, it has nothing to do with, you see very, you see very much the Gnostic stuff. It has nothing to do with how I live. Oh, you're so... I don't know, you're so down here, you see. I'm kind of up here, you know, and I know, I know what matters. We're like that. Well, I'm all for like that, but part of like that is living and walking and conducting and being, you see. That's what John is saying, as plain as the nose on my face, okay? So he's pretty clear about it. Here's how Colin Cruz states the thrust of verses 3 through 6. Those who keep God's commands may have assurance that they are people who know God. Those who claim to know God while not obeying His commands are liars. Those who say they live in God must walk as Jesus walked, that is, keeping God's commands to them as Jesus obeyed God's commands to Him. This is what John is saying. We need no apology for it. To sit here and say, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm afraid that, you know, I know that makes me sound. This is what John is saying. And we need to tell people this. Because when we don't tell them this, like I said, I think what we're doing is robbing them of a God-given means of assurance that they can put their hearts at rest. 
chapter 2, 7 to 11. He says, Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment that you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light already is shining. The one who claims to be in the light while hating his brother is still in the darkness. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and in it there is no cause for stumbling. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In verse 7, verse 7, I'm writing a new commandment to you, but an old, I'm not, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment that you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you've heard. John has been writing about the Christian obligation to keep God's commandments, and now he narrows that focus to a particular commandment, the particular commandment to love one another. He's been talking about how important this is that we obey, we submit, we walk in this path, and now he narrows down his focus to this particular commandment to love one another. That he's referring to that commandment, that he's, that he's referring to the commandment to love one another is clear from the fact love is the subject of verses 9 through 11. So it's pretty clear he's after that. But you see in 2 John verse 5, And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though writing a new commandment, but one which you've had from the beginning, let us love one another. So he makes pretty clear that's what's going on in, in chapter 3, verse 11. For this is the message we've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So this is a, he's narrowing the focus down to this particular commandment to love one another. And in John's battle with the false teachers who showed no brotherly love toward the faithful Christians, that's the context of this. See, they seceded and had withdrawn from them. All they saw in the faithful Christians, those who are abiding and holding to the true gospel, all they saw in them was a, a field for pulling people into their heresy. They didn't have any brotherly love toward those people. They didn't care about them. They showed no brotherly concern for the faithful to whom John is writing. And so he's again appealing to the origin of the command that he's binding. You remember how he started off saying that, that I'm the original stuff, what we heard, this was original, this is what you had from the beginning, what we had from the beginning? Well, he's again doing that in that battle with the false teachers. He's appealing to the origin of the command he's binding, the command to love one another is not something he recently dreamed up. It's not something that he just spun off and said, these years down the road, let me create something and let me come up with some new thing that will expose these false teachers to show that they are not of the truth because they're not loving the faithful. It's not like that at all. This commandment that we are to love is something that they'd learned from the very beginning of their Christian experience. This is something foundational. This is an ethical requirement that was been there. It accompanied the gospel. When you heard the gospel and you received it back from the very beginning, part of that was this ethical requirement that we love one another. It was part of that instruction that you received. So it's nothing new I'm dreaming up. You had it from the very beginning of your involvement with Jesus Christ. But in verse 8 he says, Yet I'm writing a new commandment which is true in him and in you because the darkness is passing away and the true light already is shining. See, while the command to love one another was old, in what sense? It was old in the sense it was part of the original message they had received. It was part of that original ethical requirement that accompanied the spread of the gospel to them. It was in some sense new with Jesus Christ. So yes, it's old that you have had it from the beginning of your conversion and your experience with Jesus, but there is another sense in which that commandment to love one another was new with Christ. Jesus said in John 13, 34, he said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So there is some sense in which the commandment was new with Jesus. 
And the requirement, you see, the requirement of love in general, that wasn't new with Jesus. That wasn't new. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That wasn't new, you see. But what was new? What was new about the commandment to love with Jesus? Jesus enhanced the content of that command. He fleshed that command out. He invested that command with a richer and deeper meaning. In other words, he commanded a qualitatively new kind of love, a love that rested on the example of God's supreme love in Jesus himself. You see, he's, he's fleshing this out. He's giving it a newer, deeper dimension. As Cruz says in his commentary on the Gospel of John, he says, in the Old Testament, the Israelites were commanded to love their neighbor as they love themselves. Leviticus 19.18. But Jesus says to his disciples, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This raised the ante considerably. The measure of love for their neighbor was no longer their love for themselves, but Jesus' love for them. Now that's pretty powerful, you see. Of course, Jesus' love was one of selfless sacrifice, even to the point of death. Now that's serious. He calls them to love, and he's giving it this qualitatively new dimension. He's deepening it. He's enriching it. So, yeah, yeah, we know what it means to love. He says, do you? <laughs> I'm going to show you the kind of love I'm talking about. I'm going to show you a love to bless other people that will be so selfless that I will die for them. And in addition, a disciple is to love Anyone who needs compassion and help. You remember that whole discussion about, well, who is my neighbor? You know, I you love my neighbor. Yeah, but who is my neighbor? Well, see, disciples are called to love anybody who needs their compassion and help. Regardless of race, rank, nationality, social standing, any of that. That's why it's just, you know, one of the shameful things in the history of Christianity has been racism and that kind of stuff. No place for it in the body of Christ. You see, in this idea that not only do we have fellowship, but loving people outside the church without regard to those kinds of boundaries and lines. You see, that's, it gives that dimension, even to the point of loving our enemies. Is that radical? Yes, it is. Yes, that's the whole point. That's Christianity. He says, which is true in him and in you. You see, I'm writing a new commandment, this new dimension, this commandment of Christian love, kingdom love, new love, and he says, which is true in him and in you, and in you. See, John says that the newness or the difference of this command was a reality in the life of Christ and also in the lives of John's readers. They were exhibiting true Christian love. They were exhibiting kingdom love. And in this, they differed markedly from the false teachers. So what does he want them to do? He wants to assure them. And he says that if you're these kinds of people, you can take assurance. And he tells you, you are loving as Christ loved. So why are you letting these people disturb your peace? You ought to know. You ought to know. That you're in fellowship with God. And you see there's power in Christ to live a morally distinctive life. He tells them that this is, this is a reality in Christ's life and in their lives. And I think we have to recognize that there's power in Christ to live morally distinctive lives. See, these Christians, like countless others in history and today, they were doing it. And we, we don't say, no, you can't say that. Well, he's not doing it perfectly. I know that. Why don't we just make a footnote down here and nobody does it perfectly. And then can we dispense with always having to say that and making that the focus of everything so that we can't speak of righteousness, we can't speak of holiness? He's not talking about that, you see, but they were exhibiting kingdom love. They were exhibiting this. It was a reality in their lives. They were doing it. Countless others have done it. 
And they were in the terminology of Matthew chapter 5, 16, letting their light shine in this dark world so that others may see their good deeds and give glory to God. See, we have allowed, in my judgment, we have allowed the danger of self-righteousness to muffle the truth that God transforms lives. See, we don't want to talk about His transforming work for fear that will be perceived as self-righteousness, that somehow that's what you mean. We rightly emphasize our continual dependence on the grace of God for salvation, but we must not leave the impression, we cannot leave the impression that Christ does nothing to free us from the practice of sin. That Christ does nothing, that, that the only difference between us and the world is that our sins are forgiven and theirs aren't. It's like the bumper sticker you see. Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. Okay, I understand what they're driving at, but if by just forgiven, they mean to suggest there is no difference between the Christian and the non-Christian except that the Christian has been forgiven and the non-Christian is not, that's just not true. That's just not true. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, verse 17 to 19, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, that's who you were. Though you were slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart the pattern of teaching to which you were delivered. And having been freed from sin, were enslaved to righteousness. You were slaves of sin. You had the gospel and you received it. And now what? You're enslaved to righteousness. He says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. And I think what he's after there is he's using slavery to talk of the freedom that you have in Christ and the release and all that. And I think he doesn't want any negative connotations of slavery to be thrown over onto what he's saying. So he says, I'm using this basically as an analogy because I need to communicate. I think that's what he means by that. He says, for just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and to lawlessness, your body in this world, how you acted, what you did, what you said... You see, he says, for just as you presented your members as slaves to uncleanness and to lawlessness, leading to lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. We are on a journey of sanctification. We are empowered by the Spirit of God. We are being transformed by the Spirit of God. We are not just like the world, except that we've been forgiven. That's not the only difference. And we're just leery about that. We don't want to say that because that way, you know, somebody might think, well, then I need to transform and change. And that might make it as, you know, less acceptable. I, I, you know, I don't want to do that. But we can't sacrifice that. That's the truth of God. See, when, when, when we give the impression to converts, when we give that impression that they should not expect a changed life, but only a changed standing before God. We do them a great disservice. We do them a disservice see, by, by depriving them of the expectation of God's transforming work in their lives. We cause them to lower their sights and to be content with the status quo. We discourage them from cooperating with the Spirit and allowing the Spirit the radical transformation He is trying to work in our lives. So when you lower their sight and say, don't expect anything, the only difference, you're just forgiven. You're just like you were before. God didn't rescue you from that. He didn't do that. He simply forgave you. Now you go on and live your life just like you were in the same rut, the same difficulty, the same sin. You stay in that. There's no power to come out of that. That's a lie. That's a lie. There is power. And people who are trapped in sin need to hear that. That you are not trapped that way. That there's power in Christ to be freed from those bonds. And we have to let people hear that and have to let people know that. Because if we don't, the people miss a rich blessing from God. He says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light already is shining. See, this realization... This implementation of Christian love, of new love in their lives, was a result of the passing of the old age or the old order of reality. I have said countless times 
It's one of the things. But in, in teaching, you have to say things so many times because, first of all, many people aren't listening to begin with. But even when they're listening, they think they know what you're saying, and it just washes over them. But I've said countless times that Jesus coming, it inaugurated the new age, the kingdom of heaven, but its consummation awaits the second coming. So we presently live in an overlap of ages where the new age, the new order, the new creation is a present reality, but the old order, the old age, the one that's characterized by death, mourning, suffering, crying, pain, continues until Christ returns at the consummation when everything that's contrary to the eternal purpose of God is stripped out. And then the kingdom of God is the sole reality. See, so this inauguration, it is though the not yet has been pulled into the now. And that's what he's talking about here, you see. So we presently live in an overlap of ages, a time in which the age to come has broken into this reality in the person and work and ministry of Jesus Christ. And the presence of this kingdom love, this new love, this Christian love that was true in them and in Christ, it's fruit of that invasion. It's fruit of that invasion, you see. That's how the church is to be, that you look and you say, what's up with these people? We are kingdom-loving people. Look how they love each other. Look how they love everybody else. Look how they don't care about status and all these other things. They love like people don't love in this world. What's up with them? Well, we are kingdom people. We are living in light of the invasion of the kingdom of God. That's how we're living. And it's reflected in how we love and treat one another. And that's what he's talking about, I'm convinced, when he says the darkness is passing away and the true light's already shining. It's already broken in. In the coming of Jesus Christ. He says in <clears throat> verse 9. One who claims to be in the light while hating his brother. Is still in darkness. See the false teachers. They apparently didn't believe that their unbrotherly treatment of the orthodox. John's community. Faithful Christians. Those from whom they had walked away. They apparently didn't believe that their unbrotherly treatment of them. That it was a sin. You see, as far as they were concerned, it didn't constitute walking in darkness. And he had talked about that before. Well, John specifically rejects that view. He says those who hate fellow believers, meaning those who don't love them. That's it. It's, it's binary. <laughs> you got just two options. You hate them or you love them. There's no middle ground. Those who hate fellow believers, meaning they, those who don't love them, they're, they're walking in darkness. And according to chapter 1, verse 6, they are lying about having fellowship with God. What's he pointing to? Well, these false teachers who are treating you this way, listen to what I'm telling you, John says to them. They're hating you, and that's proof positive that they are, in fact, walking in darkness, and therefore, they don't really have a relationship with God. I heard that bell. Thanks.